So I think all of you have seen the pictures on your bulletin. Clayton Kratz, uh, born in November 5, 1896. And so uh, that's 100, uh, 125th anniversary. He went to Russia in 1920. And that's as far as this community knows, that is his story. Uh, thanks to Forrest Moyer and Sarah Berg, and I have this picture uh, that we think is uh, Kratz's homestead. There he is with his parents. Which one of these, Sarah, do you know which house this is? Is this the one in town here? Do you, do you happen to know? That's the one out of town. Okay. Uh, okay. Sarah has extra maps if you didn't, if you were too shy to come up for the children's program. Uh, and this, this is uh, uh, Clayton uh, at the Hilltown Senior Class. I think he's there in the front row, second, second one in 1914. So we're back before the memory of anyone living. And then he was also a teacher at the Blue School, uh, 19, uh, 1915. And so that's a little bit of background and thanks to others who helped to uh, put some of these uh, slides uh, together. And then the critical thing that was happening in the larger community is this delegation of four Mennonites from Russia had come and asked if they could get assistance from uh, Mennonites here in the United States and Canada. And that group assembled in July 1920 at the Prairie Street Mennonite Church in Elkhart, Indiana. It was 13 people in five different Mennonite groups. They came together. There were a lot of a lot of sort of precursor organizations in these various groups of Mennonites that were responding in one way or another. But the effort was, uh, can we come together because we can work better if we are uh, working jointly? And that's why it got this name that doesn't really mean anything, Mennonite Central Committee. Sometimes people think it has some relationship with the Soviet Central Committee, but it, but it doesn't. Uh, and so these were the three young men, all associated with Goshen College, who were asked to go uh, on this assessment team, Arthur Schlegel, Clayton Kratz, and Ori Miller. And so they set out September 1, 1920, uh, from New York City, went to Constantinople, Schlegel stayed behind, Kratz and Miller went up into the Russian uh, community. So this is the initial assessment team. Ori Miller, here picture in two, uh, 1915, he was among those who went. He then earned his living in his father-in-law's shoe factory in Akron, Pennsylvania. That's why MCC is in Akron, because Ori Miller was working in Akron. And Ori Miller is working in Akron because he married a young woman from Akron. And Ori Miller married a young woman from Akron because on his first date at Goshen College, he and a buddy were going on a double date, and they hadn't decided which girl was going with which guy. Ori Miller said, I will take the second girl coming down the steps as my date. You take the first one. It's because of that decision. He married, he, he, he married, uh, he married his wife, uh, and she uh, was living in Akron, and that's why MCC is in Akron today. He was a volunteer administrator for more than 20 years, never took a paycheck from MCC. Some of you have seen John Sharp's book, uh, a, a very good biography of uh, Ori Miller. This is Arthur Schlegel. Uh, he is really the hero of getting this work done because uh, he was the one who organized these material aid shipments that were going out. Uh, he died uh, young, though. Uh, a, a Guernsey bull killed him in 1942. Uh, he was married to a, a worker he met, the Vesta Zuka I mentioned this morning, in Constantinople. And this, of course, is Clayton Kratz, about ready to enter his senior year at Goshen College, and he was engaged to be married to Edith Miller. Um, and this is uh, Arthur Schlegel writing this as they're leaving now in September 1. And you can see that there. Uh, he says, uh, uh, he says the, I saw the New York skyline fade away in the distance this afternoon as our ship struck out across the Atlantic. It gives one a strange feeling. What will our experience be? This was new. People had not done this in this kind of way much before. And so there they're on their way. I found this little tidbit interesting. Uh, this is Slago again writing on September 12. They're now on the water. He says, Ori and I sing together a while every day. Kratz doesn't care to sing much. Uh, so. I don't know if you knew that about our friend Clayton Kratz or not, but uh, that was uh, the assessment of, uh, of his uh, friend Arthur Schlegel. Uh, on the way, uh, and in this journey to Constantinople, once they landed in what is today Turkey, these three young Mennonite men uh, m uh, met a traveling priest, and he invited them to join him in an audience with the Pope. I found that to be an interesting little historical tidbit that, uh, that Kratz uh, had an audience with the Pope because of that invitation. So this is on the way there. And now this is the fateful juncture. 
uh, when Kratz is in the little community of Hobstadt with the Mennonite uh, families, unexpectedly the Red Army swept into Hobstadt one night. They found this American. What are you doing here? Are you a spy? Why are you here? They arrested him, took him away. The Mennonites pled for his release, and he was released, but 12 days later he was arrested again, and that is the end of the story. His disappearance to this day, even though there are historians who have poked around in this in the post-USSR era since 1989-1990, but we have not found any evidence of what happened to Kratz. These are some of the artifacts. The uh, Historical Society here, Mennonite Historians of Eastern Pennsylvania, have, have a nice collection of uh, uh, Kratz artifacts. This is the Alvin Miller, then, who actually arrived in January uh, 1921, whose job was literally to go banging on the doors of the embassies of Russia and Ukraine, saying, we have people willing to help, but we must have permission to work. And it was, it was a year after Kratz disappeared that MCC finally, in October 1921, gained permission first to Russia, then to Ukraine. And that's when this new organization with the objective to help the people in Russia was finally realized. It took almost a year and three months or so to actually get uh, to the final objective. In the meantime, working in Constantinople with orphanages and displaced people, refugees of various sorts. This is what a typical uh, uh, Mennonite family in Russia would have looked like. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Mennonites who lived in this area a century ago, this is uh, styles of clothing that are quite different than what we would have known uh, here in, in this uh, community. But it was a desperate situation. I talked about 42 people who died Main Street alone in the one village as B.B. Jantz wrote in Christmas Day 1921. Uh, but we have, we have hungry people and hungry horses. They are, they are making flour from thistle stems and things like that, eating whatever they could. One account talks about how when you enter the village, you no longer hear any dogs. They have all been eaten. Uh, and some of them, some of the horses, of course, didn't make it. This horse is no longer hungry. These are the two young women, Vesta Zuck and Venora Weaver. They came in the spring of 1921. They did not get, they did not have an opportunity to enter Russia. They served with MCC in Constantinople. And finally, the permission is given to go into Russia. And uh, the, it was, this was an interesting uh, negotiation. They, the requirements of these uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine authorities was that if you're helping people in an area, you must help everyone. MCC started specifically to, in response to the request from the Mennonites. They intended to help the Mennonites. The Russians are saying, no, if you're in an area, you help everyone. And so it was arranged with the Quakers that they were assigned to geographic areas that had high concentrations of Mennonites. So they helped everyone. Most of them happened to be uh, in that area. Most of them happened to be Mennonites. And it's this kind of food that went in. This is a food packet. Uh, MCC doesn't typically send this kind of food internationally much anymore. We send canned meat. But you should be aware that domestically here, in, even in this area, uh, there are food boxes that go to New York City and Philadelphia and Reading, uh, put together by MCC volunteers. In fact, the biggest single contributor of those food boxes is the Horse and Buggy Mennonites, the Groffdale Mennonite Conference from the Lancaster area. Some of you know they're not Amish, they're Mennonites, just very conservative Mennonites. They assemble every December at Shady Maple and make, uh, uh, make a thousand boxes that go out to the urban areas. Uh, th this is a 2019 picture from a building that was uh, Jacob Dick's lumber factory 100 years ago, and it's one of the places where a feeding station was set up. So this is a recent picture of an old place with an old story. Uh, this is the kind of feeding that was happening. Uh, you can imagine all these children, children lined up. Some of you have heard some folks give first-hand accounts of this. Uh, many of you would know the name Peter Dick. Uh, Peter uh, uh, describes MCC as having saved his life when he's a six-year-old, 1920, and he's in Russian communities. And he told me one time, he said that in our community in 1920, the pastor would go out to the cemetery some distance from the town in the morning for the first funeral, and he would just stay there uh, because uh, during the day because there would be subsequent funerals during the day. That was Peter's description of his childhood experience before MCC food came. Thousands and thousands as the uh, final record of the, uh, this uh, response uh, describes. Um, uh, and this is a thank you note uh, MCC got back from the, after the feeding. 
1923. Here in the Valley of the Shadow of Death are your appearance and your untiring efforts with those of Professor Miller, that's Alvin Miller, under the direction of the brethren in the distance, that's folks here, promises to us a thousandfold blessing. We understood that you have come to suffer with the suffering and weep with the weeping. May you be used in the fullest sense of the Good Samaritan to apply oil and wine to the wounds in Christ's blessed name. In the end, all help cometh from him. B.B. Jance writing now in April 1922 when the re relief supplies had started to flow. Uh, now they're trying to farm. The horses are gone, stolen, starved, eaten. And so you can see how they're harrowing the fields. These are a Mennonite couple close to Kortitsa in, uh, in um, Russia. And then at the end of 1922, 1923, John Epp, a farmer in Kansas, said, you know, we have these newfangled things now. The Ford Motor Company now spun off, and the Ford and Son, the Fordson tractor, it's this new tractor. It, has, it doesn't have a frame that the engine and, and uh, the uh, uh, differential sets on. The engine block and the uh, differential at the back creates the frame. It's a nice tractor. We should send tractors. So MCC arranged for 50 Fordson tractors. This is one just like it. This one did not go to Russia, but this is one just like it. Thanks to Sarah Bergen's work and some of the rest of you here for getting that out here. Take a close look at it. Uh, we had an old order horse and buggy Mennonite guy who painted it for us and he actually got it running. MCC did not invest, donated dollars in that. There were a couple of old men who would see this thing around MCC and say, we want to get that thing running. So uh, it, it, we haven't run it recently, but it is in condition that it could be running. But we, uh, we used a winch, winch to get it up on Denny Krause's uh, trailer uh, rather than trying to drive it. And uh, those cleated wheels would be a pretty clackety affair uh, in any case. Uh, and here they're at work, fortune tractors in Russia. There, I think they're tilling the ground. This is the development work. MCC does relief work, MCC does development work, MCC does this work with the pervasive presence of the peace of Christ. Relief, development, peace in the name of Christ. Food was MCC's first relief effort. This is MCC's first development effort, helping communities help themselves. Here they are planting, uh, and, uh, and then shortly they are having uh, harvest. So here's a threshing machine. They're harvesting grain that's possible because of the Fords and tractors. After the tractors were sent, MCC sent, uh, or the Mennonites in Russia sent MCC a thank you note. Uh, in German, the Denkschrift, a thank you note from Mennonites. I actually have out here at the table on the tractor some copies of this Denkschrift and some English translations. If any of you have interest in that, I mean, even just as a conversation piece or a keepsake, uh, I have. Uh, copied the Denkschrift and the English translation. You can take it along. They use very interesting, colorful language in describing the thank you to MCC and communities like your community right here uh, for sending those tractors. So this is, uh, this is assistance to Russia. The program name that MCC used, sometimes when MCC has a certain program, they give it a name. Some of you will remember uh, the, a very large push against a, uh, HIV infection, and we called the program Generation at Risk, that we raised lots of money to help people who were suffering because of AIDS. This program was called American Mennonite Relief. Uh, so this is what American Mennonite Relief, MCC's program in Ukraine and Russia, sent. And so you can see that it's it's uh, some of the items there, the tractors and plows. One we don't talk about very much was a sheep and wool project. That was an effort to, again, that's a development project in, uh, in Ukraine. In more than, um, in, in these uh, several years of the initial response, more than in modern dollars, $20 million was sent to uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine in this season. So, The Feeding the Hungry, uh, this is a book, I have a copy of it over here if any of you want to see it. Uh, yeah, that's actually a book uh, with uh, Alvin Miller, uh, who was uh, the one who actually got the permission to work in Russia. I bought that one at Book Savers down in Ephrata, part of the uh, reuser shop in Ephrata, and it has Alvin Miller's signature, and he gave it as a gift to somebody, and eventually came back to Book Savers, and now it's mine, and I'm not going to sell it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the, these, these contributions of Clayton Kratz, it says uh, Kratz likely never had any knowledge about MCC's response. Kratz was gone, at least out of communication, 
perhaps not even living, by the time what I've just been telling you happened. Kratz did not know that food came. Kratz did not know, as far as we know, that Alvin Miller came and banged on the doors of Russia and Ukraine, got permission, food came, lives are saved, tractors came. Eventually, a lot of folks left Russia and went to uh, Canada and, or South America. He, will ne he never knew that as far as we know. Uh, and the sacrifice that he that he made and so it's a function of this church to help to carry on that story uh, Today, so thank you for planning uh, today's event. I think it's appropriate um, These original three for those of you who know some of these stories these names are not a stranger Certainly not Ori Miller certainly not Clayton Kratz and many of you are also uh, Aware perhaps of the third team member Arthur Slagle who was actually the workhorse of the three but there's another story, and one of the things that MCC does is helps people to discover the stories that sometimes are neglected. There are many people in the world and many people in our society whose stories are worth telling, and sometimes we forget them and we neglect them. And so I'm going to turn the Kratz story over here and share a little bit of uh, some original research that, that I did. Um, and so if you can see on the text there, maybe I'll... So Kratz, Kratz is coming back to Blooming Glen to visit with his widowed mother, Elizabeth, but he's also going to stop in Maryland a little bit. And so this is a telegram here at the Mennonite Historians. Uh, we'll report to Scottdale on Friday. This happened quickly. Can you imagine making these momentous decisions in a two-week period of time? will report to Scottdale on Friday. No one knows, of course, how critical uh, that would be. And so now we have this century of mystery. Kratz was arrested in the Mennonite community in 1920. He was never heard from again. This is the story of the one who was lost. This is the story we know. This is the story we tell. But MCC envisions communities worldwide in right, right relationship with one another, with God and creation. And one mechanism to span those fractures and those fissures in our world is to know the stories on the other side. And so we're going to take this one rather familiar Kratz story and turn it over today. I also intend to stop in Maryland a little bit. It's not very far from Scottdale. He heads to Pinto, Maryland to visit with the girl that he plans to marry. This is their last meeting. They don't know that. And so Edith Miller is in Pinto, Maryland, but she has moved her with her family from Springs, Pennsylvania, close to Grantsville, Pinto, Maryland, to Inwood, West Virginia, uh, to Worcester, Ohio. And um, a sister told me about uh, Edith Miller and Clayton Kratz. She said, sister told me, she never forgot Kratz, never forgot him. Uh, a granddaughter told me of this, Mil of this Edith Miller. She had tears in her eyes when she spoke of him. This loss follows her across seven decades and across many communities. Edith Miller moved. Edith Miller had many new experiences, but that 70-year loss in October of 1920 was never forgotten, never forgotten. Here are the three Miller sisters. Uh, Elva is on the right. Edith, the woman to whom uh, Kratz is engaged, and Maud, the youngest one, is on the, uh, 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 let's see, turn the other way. I'm not sure which way we're looking at this. But anyway, Edith is in the Miller. Um, her sister Maud told me, said, look at Edith's fingers. They're long and prominent. She could reach a full octave on the piano. When we moved to West Virginia, she was given a piano by one of her many suitors, but she was still hopeful that Kratz would return. This woman has many suitors, one who gave her a piano. Uh, that's a pretty big gift. 
And then Edith Miller, now four years later, writes, and she, writing to a friend, uh, she says, I, uh, now, now about Clayton, Edith Miller writes, I always felt about Ori Miller and Mr. Schlegel just as you do. I used to think a great deal of them, but since they are back from Russia, I can't help but have an ill feeling toward them just because of the cool way they treat Kratz's disappearance. I know I should not have that feeling. I try to break myself of it, but it crops up every now and then. Ori Miller comes home, he's married, he has a good job, he has a daughter, life goes on. Arthur Schlegel comes home, he marries a woman he met in service. Clayton Kratz does not come home. Edith Miller is there with a wounded heart and empty hands and her hope chest, what do I do with this now? And so uh, she, she, is feeling, she is feeling that loss. And then there were occasionally reports, once a photograph that somebody said, I wonder if that's Kratz. And the family and Edith and, Edith, uh, and uh, Kratz's mother would grab a hold of these. Edith writes, I am confident he is living and will return within the next year. Just that little bit of news, although it is very uncertain, gave me so much hope. A woman waiting. There's Edith Miller with her friend. She's one of the... picture of her with her friends uh, certainly on a on a happy day here um, Kratz's mother uh, is uh, is still living and uh, at this point and the host mother that was in the home where Kratz was taken from writes to his mother whose tombstone across the road right next to Clayton's memorial is pictured there and she writes and you can see it there uh, our great almighty God left it come to pass oh how many tears were shed already and how many mothers hearts were broken already of course she knows of the starvation and the dip disruption and the and the invasion of the Red Army it's mother to mother across many miles host mother in Russia and Kratz's mother here at Blooming Glen but hope was not to be fulfilled. In 1946, the um, Clayton Kratz Fellowship put this memorial stone there. It's not a gravestone. Um, and uh, I, I should recognize Dave Friesen. He's the one who invited me to come to talk to the Clayton Kratz Fellowship 25 years ago for the 100th birthday of, of Clayton Kratz. And uh, that's what helped me to get, uh, get started with the story. Thank you, Dave, for helping to move that story uh, deep into my heart. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is Rose Kennedy writing, and it seems to apply here. Rose Kennedy lost three sons due to intentional violence. Joe died in World War II, and John and Robert were assassinated. And she writes, it has been said, time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain, and time, the mind protecting its sanity, covers them with scar tissue and the pain lessens. But it is never gone. A mother who buried three sons. In her 104 years, Rose Kennedy lost three of her sons. And so Edith's life goes on. By 1926, she's out in Ohio, and there's a man, I don't know his first name, by name of Smucker, would like to marry her. Kratz is gone now six years, never heard from him. And so she gives, uh, she gives her yes, that she will marry this man, assuming Kratz is not returning. But a month before the wedding, she says, I cannot do this. And she breaks off the wedding. Uh, she waits another four years, and then there's a man from the Presbyterian Church who again proposes marriage. Kratz has gone 10 years. They've never heard anything from him. And so she does marry um, uh, Lautenschlager, and uh, they go on uh, to have a family. Here is Edith and Earl Lautenschlager. They had two sons and a daughter. So the woman on the left of the picture is the woman who Kratz intended to be his wife. She is not. She is Earl Lautenschlager's uh, wife. She was working many, many years, now living in, uh, in and around Orville in Worcester, Ohio. She worked at Worcester College for many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, in the uh, Mennonite community, sort of out of sight and out of mind. Uh, so the Edith Miller story took a trajectory quite different from the, uh, the Clayton Kratz story. Um, for 80 years, uh, pretty much uh, separated ways, because once she married into the Presbyterian Church and, and, and worshipped and lived there, uh, the Mennonites lost contact with her. And then after those 80 years, uh, one day John Ruth told me, he said, you know, Ken, he said, there's a story uh, that somewhere there's a hope chest that 
or, uh, that uh, Clayton Kratz gave to Edith Miller. And he had a last name and, and a city, Wooster. That's all I knew, a last name and a city in Wooster. I guess John Ruth knew that this might intrigue me, and he was right. Most of you would know the name John Ruth, local historian, well known here. Wrote a big fat book about Lancaster Mennonite Conference. Uh, would sleep in the archives at the Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society because he worked so late. So one of my MCC colleagues in Ohio sent me, uh, this was before e much email, this was before much of the web, this is a, a number uh, of years ago now, almost, two, uh, well, more than two decades, sent me a phone book page, uh, faxed it to me. So I went to uh, Worcester, Ohio, and uh, uh, I went to the list there and started looking and found some names of the last name that he, that he mentioned. And one day I was out in... Uh, uh, in uh, the, the Mennonite Relief Sale, uh, just 15 miles east of Worcester in Kidron, Ohio. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna step away from this sale a little bit and I'm gonna go and just take this page from this phone book and gonna poke around a little bit. And so uh, that's, that's, what I, that's what I did. Uh, I, uh, I went out to, uh, drove west 15 miles to Worcester and I, I uh, looked up, uh, found a map, uh, this was before MapQuest and all that kind of stuff, and drove out to a, a little rural road just outside of Worcester and came up to a split level house and uh, I thought, uh, this is the name, the last name on the mailbox, but I have no idea if it's the right person. And I went and knocked on the door. Then I thought, you know, I should think what I'm going to say, you know. I, uh, I knocked on the door and a woman from upstairs looked out and said, can I help you? And I said, does the name Clayton Kratz mean anything to you? Um, no, no, I don't, no, I don't think so. I said, does the name Edith Miller mean anything to you? And she said, um, well, that was the maiden name of my grandmother, she said. I said, uh, but you don't know anything about Kratz. And by this time, she had come down inside, and we were both standing on the front porch. And I could see the gears in her mind sort of turning. And she said, no, I don't know the name Clayton Kratz, but I do know, I do know that um, Grandma talked about somebody called Kratzy. I said, that's who I mean, Kratzy. What do you know about Kratzy? I then knew I was on to something. And uh, I and uh, I and, and you know what you know what she told me, uh, she said the only thing she knew about Kratzy is he disappeared in the service, uh, so that's what she knew. This is Vicky in Wooster, Ohio. He disappeared in the service, and I thought of this poem, Flanders Field, um, World War One era, same era. Uh, where uh, these dead lie rows and rows of crosses. Uh, they, are, they are there, they are forgotten, they are lost in the service. So many people were in Edith Miller's same situation of young men who went to Europe in the second decade of the 20th century and never came back. They were lost in the service, Flanders Field. So there I'm standing, I said, uh, and that's all you know, lost in the service. And uh, she said, yes. I said, do you know that this Kratzy was part of an organization that was birthed 100 years ago, well, it was almost 100 years at that point, and now 15 miles away, there are thousands and thousands of people together in Berlin, Ohio, raising money for this organization. It's called Mennonite Central Committee. She knew nothing of it. And so I told her, I said, Kratzy had a central role in the vision of developing uh, this uh, Mennonite Central Committee. And then on the tip from John Ruth, I said, and I was really pushing the edges now, I said, uh, Vicki, uh, there's a rumor that Kratzy gave Edith Miller a hope chest. They're going to be married and gave Edith Miller a hope chest. Do you, do you know anything about a chest that is attached to the Kratzy story? Um, and she said, um, she said, yes. I said, uh, do you know where it is? Uh, she said, yes. Um, I said, will you tell me where it is? <laughs> she said, yes. I said, where is it? She said, upstairs in the bedroom. <laughs> then I was really feeling brave. I said, may I see it? <laughs> she stepped back a few steps and she said, Ken, I don't really know you very well. <laughs> I said, I understand. I understand. There's a man on your front porch saying, can I go upstairs in the, into the bedroom? Well, yeah. Uh, 
So I said, never mind. I get through here from time to time. I've all, I sometimes travel with my wonderful, beautiful wife, Karen, and I may get through here again. Uh, so I said, is there a chest? Do you know where it is? In 2003, the Conservative Mennonite Conference, which is one of the supporting denominations of MCC, was meeting in Hartville, Ohio. I was there, I got on the phone, and I called Vicki and said, hey Vicki, you remember me, Kratzy, Chest? She said, yes. I said, I'm here in Hartville, Karen's with me. Can the two of us come to Worcester and see the chest? And she said, please, please come. And those are the pictures I took of the hope chest that John Ruth put me on. Uh, on. Uh, as far as I know, that is still in Vicki's bedroom up there, and as far as I know, nobody else has come to the front porch asking if they can see it. Uh, Edith Miller died uh, in uh, 1990. This is the tombstone. Any of you who get to Ohio, go to Apple Creek. It's right there, not far from everything else that Mennonites do in Ohio, uh, and in uh, Holmes County and, uh, uh, and uh, surrounding counties. In the Presbyterian Cemetery, you can go up there and you can see uh, Earl Lautenschlager and Edith Miller Lautenschlager, 1902 to 1990. And so today we remember a story, a painful, painful story that is on the other side of sort of the heroic and truly heroic story of Clayton Kratz giving his life, but we flip it over and we see seven decades of, of loss that were never, that was never, never resolved. Today, MCC would pay much more attention to that because we know better. Uh, Glenn, MCC keeps very regular contact with Glenn Lapp's parents who died in Afghanistan in 2010. Glenn's birthday was this week, and there was exchange with his mother and father just remembering that. If Glenn were here, he'd be 51. Glenn is not 52. Glenn is not here, but we have not forgotten him. But today, we remember uh, Edith Miller. If some of you would have, just like, just for, just for the day or just to put on your refrigerator, I made copies of this slide. They're on the table out there, Karen, I believe, at the, at the tractor. Uh, just paper copies of this. Uh, take one along, along with the Denk Shrift, if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to take, uh, take it along. Today, we remember this story, and we share across the seven decades of Edith Miller's loss in relation to the Clayton Kratz story, and we remember that that, too, was a burden that was borne by someone that we have not remembered as MCC was coming into being. We do have this promise though, there'll be no more death or mourning, no more crying, all that has passed away. This woman here was a major informant for all of this. This is little Maudie on the picture with Edith. Uh, Edith. She lived to be uh, 103 and Karen and I had an opportunity to visit with her, and she's a sister. She was thrilled to reconnect with this story. See, she had lost this story too. And I could tell her about books, I could tell her about videos, I could tell her about uh, the, the uh, kinds of things I'm telling you here. She didn't really have, although she grew up in a Mennonite home, she had also been separated that from a long, long time. So this was sort of a, a voice out of season, living until 2017, and without Maud's input and the presentation I'm just giving you, we would be, we would be much the, the poorer. But today, we do remember Kratz, November 5, 1896, and he went to Russia. And so far, that's what we know. We trust perhaps in eternity we will know more. I want to invite your comments, your questions. Some of you, some of you might have some connections to the Kratz family in this neighborhood. I understood that there was a a great nephew here this morning. I don't know if he's still here. I want to meet him if he is. Uh, but uh, yeah, C questions or comments or something that you'd like to comment on? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. I don't know exactly where the, uh, the source is. One of the things that MCC does today is many times we'll buy materials close to the uh, site of the disaster, if you can, in times of disaster. I would have the impression that this stuff either came from Europe or America, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But there was, there, the clothing came from, came from uh, the US. Uh, so people were collecting clothing, uh, collecting, uh, collecting funds. But uh, as far as I would know, but that's a great question. I don't have a great answer to uh, uh, Europe or the US. The European Mennonites have been part of this uh, for, uh, part of MCC, participating since, uh, since the beginning, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yes. I repeat the question. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, the question was about the aid that went into Russia. Did that come from, from across the Atlantic or did it come from more regionally? And certainly the clothing and certainly the tractors from, from the U.S. I would have the impression that much, if not all, of the food was also from the U.S. But I wouldn't be certain that there weren't, because there were good connections in Europe, uh, that some of it may have come from Europe as well. Yeah. Another question, comment, observation. Oh, okay. In Malachna Colony. Mm hmm. Canada. 26. Of course. Very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So this is directly connected to your family story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, this was, she was relating how the, um, her family ties, uh, your grandfather, you said, was in the Malachna colony, one of the large communities in, in, in Russia. Yeah, yeah. Another comment, question? Yes, sir. Yeah, that was, that was the new thing back in 1920 as well. Uh, th these folks who uh, had different, hist they were all Mennonites, but they had different historical trajectories, they had different practices. What's the proper way to be baptized? You could have gotten into a big argument between sort of the old Mennonites, which Blooming Glen would have represented, and the Mennonite Brethren, which was a renewal movement coming out of Russia in 1860. Uh, so it was a, a new thing of people coming uh, and working together. Uh, and one of the convincing pieces was that this was sort of a loosey-goosey informal organization. You weren't going to be overly tainted by association of a contract or anything like that. And so people came together in what was intended to be a temporary organization. This was going to be an ad hoc committee that was going to feed starving Mennonites in Russia. That's how MCC began. In fact, there were very specific plans to end MCC. Uh, and, and organize another organization. There's a Mennonite, there's an American Mennonite Relief Commission that was instituted in 1923 and was supposed to take over from MCC and become the ongoing organization, a little better organized. MCC had no, had no documents, it wasn't legally recognized, it wasn't really an entity other than the paper uh, that the Mennonites passed among themselves. It wasn't until 1937 that MCC became an, inst uh, became an institution itself. So the comment was, how did these different Mennonites come together and how is that today? Uh, the, the American Mennonite Relief Commission that reinvented 1923, that did not happen mostly because the very large and influential old Mennonite church of which Franconia Conference and of which Lancaster Conference were a part, they were, they were, they were not too sure they wanted something more firm. They liked the loose, loose bands they, and so they objected. Ori Miller was part of the old Mennonite church but they have allowed him to come as a visitor or as a guest to this uh, board, first board meeting of the American Mennonite Relief Relief Commission. Uh, that committee met twice. It's still in waiting. If Mennonite Central Committee ever is finished with its work and goes out of being, then that organization can, can come into being. But for 100 years it hasn't, and I don't think it's going to. Uh, th that same kind of thing happens today. You have people from lots of different traditions coming together, not all of them too sure about the others all of the time. I mean, sometimes it's a little bit odd that, uh, you know, the Amish guy is sitting beside the pink hair. It can get a little bit funny, you know. Uh, and so, uh, that's, but, but that's what this comes together with. We, we have Mennonites of various stripes. We have Mennonite brethren. We have brethren in Christ. Uh, we have the, uh, the Old Order Amish. In Lancaster County, we have a spinoff of the BICs called the United Zion. They're part of it. Uh, and uh, so it continues to be this amalgamation of people who share a common heritage in the Anabaptists of the 16th century and a common understanding that Christ invites us to walk in ways of discipleship following Christ daily in life and that a significant portion of that identity is a commitment to, to peacemaking. That the invitation of the Christian and the church is to, is to walk in ways that are bringing, uh, bringing the, 
the, uh, the presence of God in a peaceful way into the context in which we work. So all, that's, that's the macro picture. Uh, the details get a little messy and, and, and still get a little messy. That reticence of the Old Mennonite Church in 1923, among various groups, that's still with us today. It's one of the things that I, is, is my job to do. I, I tend a fair bit of those relationships that, uh, that can get fairly complicated sometimes. Yeah, very good questions there. Yes, please, question. I have three questions. Yes. <laughs> is there anything that, that the church is thinking about doing to uh, kind of uh, raise uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, what about the tractor and can Clayton Kratz be the first Mennonite saint? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the tractor here is is a real tractor. It's from 1922. It's one just like went to Russia, not one that went to Russia. It was to replace the horses that were lost and uh, and destroyed and stolen and eaten. And uh, this one uh, this one we bought uh, from an Amish my, uh, Amishman uh, Elias Byler in Lancaster County who sells old farm equipment. We saw this for sale. And we said we should have this. Uh, we were actually actually. Uh, um, at some point, but I think it might have been a little bit later, the original Material Resources Center, Sharon, I think had a, uh, uh, had a fortune tractor as well. But that one went to Kansas then because the new site didn't have a great place for it. Uh, uh, so this is, just to remember, MCC's first response and indeed the first development program of Mennonite farmers farming, turning the soil, planting rye, eating because of the tractor. Uh, there's some, some text in this book here of the report of that first response, and they they talked about uh, they talked about all of the uh, what's the phrase they used all the heathens and the and the Catholics came out uh, to see these crawly things going across the field because everybody was fast. Oh, no, they said heathens, Catholics, and communists all came to watch. Uh, I don't, I don't know if those are distinct groups or not, but um, uh, came, came to see these crawling, crawly things. Uh, this was a lifesaver, this kind. And it's one of the things I think that helped MCC to realize very early on that while emergency relief is necessary to save life now, it is not the long-term solution. And so when you give an undesignated dollar to MCC, the bulk of that dollar goes to development work, helping people with tractors to feed themselves, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, sainthood, uh, I have not heard a movement to sainthood, um, but I think, it, I think we do have our own sort of modest ways of doing that. Uh, uh, when apples are ripe, that children's story that Sarah used as a way of, um, uh, of remembering uh, Clayton. This kind of event right here, the memorial stone, and I, I'm serious when I say, if, you, if your walking is in condition, do walk across, 10 rows in, 13 stones up. And just, and just think about uh, the loss that the uh, Kratz family had, this congregation had, and the contribution that, that Kratz uh, made to MCC's beginning. He wasn't around in MCC very, very long, but his narrative helps to fuel interest in we can make a difference, even sometimes at, at great sacrifice. So I, no, I don't think we're going to have St. Clayton Kratz uh, but I think, I think we will remember him. I was here in this neighborhood for tw 25 years ago to remember the 100th anniversary of his birth. We are now remembering the 125th anniversary of his birth. I won't be here in 25 years, I don't think, uh, but uh, I hope somebody's remembering Clayton Kratz's uh, birth uh, for 150 years, yeah. Okay, I think, yes, uh, Dave, Dave, you have a question. Yeah. It's not a question, it's a comment. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Say, uh, Cyrus has not got to say. Uh, Sharon, I think you were going to come and talk a little bit. Sharon is the uh, manager, director over at the Harleysville Material Resources Center. Uh, a good, uh, good colleague of uh, MCC, and uh, you have uh, something to share. Thank you, Ken. It's been very interesting hearing from you. I never thought about why they needed tractors. I knew they sent tractors um, in 1920s, but I didn't think about what happened to the horses or what they did before that. So that was very good. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to, an opportunity to give some money for MCC this morning, we have a basket back there at the display table where we put our um, MRC display. 
Usually this time of year we would be having an oyster dinner that we use, you use for fundraising for MCC projects and because of COVID we're not doing that this year. So we're asking people just to give money instead. So if you'd like to be part of that, you can give some money back there at our table. Or if you're not prepared today, we have envelopes that you can take and send us a check later. Thanks. So to segue from this to our barbecue, um, the folks setting up need about a half hour. And uh, so we we'll just encourage you to have fellowship, take a look at the tractor. There's a display and some information there. Sharon will be back at her MRC table over here. If you're a visitor and have never been to our facility, our church building's open. You're welcome to, to take a look inside and wander around. There are bathrooms at the back of the hallway here. And of course, uh, Anyone who wants to play can use the playground, the Gaga pit, uh, horseshoes, whatever you'd like. Um, there is dessert, of course, as part of the meal that people brought, but there's this one additional opportunity today. Um, I'm predicting we'll start the meal close to noon, a little, give or take, five, 10 minutes. At one o'clock, the uh, current owners of the Hickory Stick ice cream shop, which is where Clayton went to school for one of his schools, our uh, Laura, one of the, the, the wife and husband team, is going to welcome us to hit the, hit the hickory stick. She does not know the Clayton Kratz history, but she knows who owned it before her, and would be glad to let you just be there and then end the day with ice cream. Here's the thing about that. They have limited parking. She said, you're welcome to park on the grass anywhere adjacent to it, but just at, at 1 o'clock, I'm just going to say we're going to head over there. Anyone who wants, um, but try to carpool if, if you, you know, can do so, so we're not taking 20 or 30 cars over for those who are interested. So we'll just say that at 1 o'clock, um, those who are interested in the Hickory Stick, the, the, which is the old schoolhouse that Clayton went to, okay, it's right out of, if you go out Blooming Glen Road, turn right at 113, just a couple miles down on the left, across from Hawkeyes. That'll be the end of the day um, as far as the Clayton Kratz related stuff. Sarah Bergen, though, does have an excellent map that will show you other local buildings and houses associated with Clayton, and she does have extras that are now available for a $100 donation to the MRC. <laughs> so, <laughs> or whatever you can bargain for with Sarah. So, uh, all right. So, um, as the folks set up in the back, other than the MRC table, if you would please um, do your visiting outside of uh, the back area so they can have space to set up tables. And as soon as they're ready, they'll just get some local or closest folks to go through the line and you'll know that the meal has begun. I'd like to give thanks now though for that meal and uh, then dismiss you for half hour of fellowship until the meal begins. Lord God, we are thankful for this whole day and I'm thankful in advance for lunch and time to share fellowship around the table. So thank you for your provision. Thank you for Ken's stories and message today that Lord, it's good to tell stories and to have reminders of your faithfulness and your call upon us to be faithful to others around us, to share in the generosity and blessing that Jesus brings to our life and to make sure that others experience that as well. So God, I pray not only thank you for the day, but just instill in each of us the servant heart of Jesus so that as we remember those who served and gave before us, we too follow that example. And that and we follow the example of Jesus, who though he was the most powerful Son of God sent to earth, took on the form of a servant among us. Let that inspire us today. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed until lunch.